All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. I think we're just going to get started. Um, I'm David Kim. I'm here on behalf of the Modern Money Network, which is a national organization that aims to bring accurate and accessible knowledge of our monetary and financial systems to the broader public. And at this time, I'd like to thank the Women's Law Association, the Tax Law and Financial Regulation Association, the American Constitution Society, and the Harvard Law and Policy Review for co-sponsoring this event. And I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Christine Passan for inviting our speaker today. Um, Professor Mercy Baradar teaches at the University of Georgia School of Law. Previously, she has taught at Brigham Young University and served as academic research fellow at NYU Law. She practices in the Financial Institutions Group at Davis Polk, and she's currently working on a history of banking in the black community in the United States. But today, she's here to talk about her first book, How the Other Half Banks, published by Harvard Unity University Press. Uh, just a quick note also on the uh, lunch today. Uh, the delivery people are running late, so during the, right before the Q&A session of our lunch talk, we're going to... Uh, be serving the food then, but uh, should be here any moment now. Um, but until then, uh, Professor Barnard will be lecturing, so please join me in welcoming Professor Barnard. I don't usually like to lecture to a hungry crowd, but I'll maybe channel your anger for some <laughs> social policy. Uh, so I want to talk about a problem, uh, reveal some of the historical causes of this problem, um, and suggest a possible remedy. I think this is you know, rare in academic books, but I kind of backed into this remedy and I'll explain um, why I think it, it is a perfect solution. Um, so the problem is about half of the US population would need to, half I said, um, would need to borrow money if they have a shortfall of between $500 um, to $1,000 due to an unexpected expense. When these people face an, an emergency, they have to borrow um, from a payday lender or title lender at something from 300 to 2,000% APR. As for basic financial services, about 30 million Americans, likely more, are what we call unbanked or underbanked, meaning that they rely primarily on some alternative financial service provider um, to cash their checks, pay their bills. This is about 10% of what these families make, and it's about what they spend on food that goes to these financial services. So it's very expensive to be poor. And when policymakers um, talk about this problem, they usually talk about it as uh, about regulating payday lenders. Okay, um, they either set uh, so the ways of regulating you can set interest rate caps. Those are difficult um, because uh, state usury law has been rendered meaningless. Um, you know the CFPB um, has a new payday lending rule out. Um, they've just passed to sort of curb some of the most egregious practices of the industry. But these efforts have been frustrating, right? Like a whack-a-mole game or a cat and mouse. Because when one um, you know, loan is banned, it pops up in another form. When interest rate rates are capped, it sort of reincarnates in an insurance product. My state of Georgia has no payday lending. Um, we've sort of successfully banned them, but of course they come in through internet loans and title loans. And title loans, I think, are worse than payday loans because you get the loan for as much interest and you lose your car if you default. Um, so uh, some see this as a problem. Of, so regulating, I think, has, has a mixed history, although not, you know, opposed to this. Um, some people see this as a problem of financial education, okay? Um, and there is, uh, go back. Um, so there is some truth to this, but it's not a complete answer. Um, the assumption here is that most people who need credit have poor money management, okay? That's the assumption on which financial education is based. But the data doesn't support that conclusion. People understand these products. They understand that it's costly. In fact, they understand um, that they're paying more for them than other people, right? So they understand the differential and the um, the cost. Um, and and you know, so if we're creating a financial education project, and I've been involved with some of these, you've got to be able to say to this group, um, go, don't do this, do that other thing. Um, and so, what I want to prove to you is that there is no other thing. There is no other place to direct people. Really, they're making a rational choice. You need $500, your car breaks down, or whatever it is. Um, you can go to a payday lender and pay this much interest, or you don't get that $500 and your car um, stays broken. Right? So there's um, financial education has been limited. Um, so there's a disparity in banking market uh, services today. There's a mainstream regulated 
federally subsidized banking sector serving the wealthy and the middle class. And then there's just wild west hodgepodge of unregulated lenders that provide services to the low or moderate income. So I want to talk about this dual market in a second, but first I want to talk about why this matters as participants in a democracy. Not, not as a sort of market failure, but why this is why this implicates our um, constitutional um, democracy. So banking um, has never been um, completely egalitarian or accessible to all. I don't want to paint this picture that we had this once you know, a long ago where banks were accessible to all. It's never been like that. But since our nation's founding, um, the sort of banking policy has been understood to be entangled with the federal government. There's always been a discussion about how the banking system should best serve the public interest. And that's been a policy level discussion, right? Um, seen it in the founding documents and in several acts of legislation at that level. So when the framers of the Constitution or the New Deal or the Federal Reserve talked about banks and how they should be regulated, they understood that they were talking more, um, not just about risk regulation and liquidity, um, but also about social policy, democracy, and the creation or elimination of inequality. Okay, um, So Alexander Hamilton thought the banks were the most important instrument of social policy. He wanted a large and powerful national bank um, to build a first-rate industrial nation, as you know from the hit play. Um, he, he won, right? Um, Thomas Jefferson said that banks were more dangerous than standing armies and sought to reduce their power over the common man um, because he promoted an agrarian economy, right? Jefferson was wrong, um, but won the debate, and so banks were forced to be small and local for most of our history. Not because that's what bankers wanted, um, but because he thought, the other policymakers thought that that's what would serve the nation's interests. Andrew Jackson right, waged a bank war against the National Bank because he believed that the National Bank was about the advancement of the few at the expense of the many. He said, the bank is trying to kill me, I will kill it. Okay. After the banking crisis of 1907, Woodrow Wilson, in creating the Federal Reserve, called for the end of the monopoly of big credits that would hinder the true liberties of men. Right? Bank liberty. We don't talk about it in those terms anymore. After the Great Depression, Louis Brandeis declared that the nation's bank should be treated as a public utility instead of a private affair because banks gain their disproportionate power through the use of other people's money. FDR said of bankers, the unscrupulous money changers stand indicted in the courts of public opinion, rejected by the hearts and minds of men. Roosevelt saw the Great Depression as a threat to the future of essential democracy and took it as a mandate to use direct, vigorous action to fight the social values more noble than mere monetary uh, profit. So these leaders um, may have been wrong in their specific propo proposals, and I argue that many of them were, but they each understood that banking regulation is just as much about liberty, democracy, equal opportunity, and equality as it is, again, about safety and soundness, um, or efficiency, or uh, profitability, which is how we tend to talk about it now. So we need to make sure banks operate safely, we need to make sure our banks are um, profitable and, and work efficiently, but we also need to make sure that they're serving the people, however you want to define them. Not only because they operate using other people's money, but also because they're entangled with the government. That has never been more true than today, um, especially with respect um, to provisions of credit. This is a bit outdated. I haven't adjusted for the recent um, uh, interest rate hikes, but today the federal government creates Credit markets through day-to-day -day lending by the Fed. They offer liquidity protection, deposit insurance. I don't even have those up there. The GSCs, FHAs, all this huge credit infrastructure that pumps into um, the banking system. Federal support of banks, whether through bailouts, interest-free loans, or just the day-to-day -day, um, uh, federal deposit insurance has never been higher. Um, the, the price of credit through, uh, flowing through the market is at an all-time low. But this federal federally subsidized and protected banking sector is not accessible to all. Okay, so I see this disparate banking sector, you know, payday lending, unregulated loans for the poor, and federally subsidized, um, bolstered credit market for those who can afford it, as not just a, a market problem, right? I see it as a social policy, um, prob a problem of democracy. Um, so it's important to understand how we got here. Um, there was a transformation in the banking sector starting in the 1970s until the 1990s that was both the result of market changes but also policy decisions, um, specifically a strong tide of deregulation. So policymakers began treating banks like other 
corporations and not like the central en engines in our economy, right, that are tied up with the federal government. Um, we started sort of listening to them as to what they wanted to um, heighten efficiency and profitability. So this caused a merger wave, um, and let's go back here, merger wave, uh, and a homogenization and conglomeration of banking that squeezed out the community banks, um, the uh, SNLs, credit unions, um, these sort of small bank institutions that were dominant since the founding. During this time, these credit unions and SNLs, banks that were, you know, created for the purpose of marketing to a lower income um, subset of the population, either merged into mainline banks or abandoned their um, social mission. So in just a decade or two, I don't know, do you all know Bailey's Bank? Um, Bailey's Bank not only lost to Potter's Bank, right, um, but it got merged into Bank of America sometime in the 2000s, right? Um, so today, a handful of banks control about 80% of the country's assets. Um, and another thing that happened during this era is that the usury laws, right, the interest rate caps um, kept ballooning. Um, where usury used to be based on some common moral principle, whether that was rooted in you know, religious instruction against usury, or some common understanding that this is, there's a cap by which we're comfortable with the poor paying um, for loans, and that um, shifted toward what will the market bear? Right? So economic um, you know, uh, models ended up deciding uh, how much usury was permitted. But in fact, there isn't really a price competition in, in usury, so Maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. So what happened is usury rate um, or interest rates went up to the cap allowable by law in most states. Um, so with usury caps essentially eradicated and community banks and SNLs gone, fringe lenders and service providers filled the void. Um, payday lenders, check cashers, title loan shops thrive in areas with the least amount of banks. Um, and there was this direct causation between the decline of community banks and the rise in these lenders. So the harder problem, now I'm going to get to the remedy, right? The harder problem is how to fix it. For the last 200 years, the answer has been community banking, okay? There is this myth, um, not just in the public opinion, but in academia, in scholarship, um, in public policy, that it's the credit union that's going to fix it, right? Every time I give one of these talks to groups, people say, well, why not? Well, can't credit unions do it, right? They're, here's my little cartoon. Can I return? When we say we have low interest loans, we mean we have very little interest in giving them. They're not interested, right? Um, credit unions and um, SNLs or the thrift sector imploded sometime in the 90s, but small community banks, they can't make money on these loans. Okay? It is not part of their business model. So they're not, um, they're not interested. I think there's still a big role for community banks to play here, but in a way that Genie's left robotic um, on, those, on that industry. Large and national banking has been the decisive winner, right, as Hamilton had predicted. So it's time to consider a public option in banking, okay? So um, here's where we come to postal banking. One way the federal government might become involved is through the existing postal banking structure. Hopefully some of you have heard of this now. When I first gave this talk, um, we used to give this talk, people were just like, you've got to be kidding. And now I think it's come a little bit more into the public conversation, thank you to um, uh, Senator Sanders. Um, so one way that the government, um, and I can talk about the politics of that later if you'd like. Um, uh, so this solution is deeply rooted in history um, that few seem to recall. So I want to go through that history a little bit and tell you the story of the post office. Um, the post office predates the Constitution, was the most robust federal involvement in the country for 100 years. It is not an overstatement to say that the post office built the foundation of our democracy. Okay? Um, the Postal Act of 1792, supported by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and George Washington, made three several, uh, three uh, crucial decisions. One is that the post would be financially supported by the Treasury. It would be self-sustaining but not profitable. Okay? This was, again, back in the day where there was no federal government. Okay? Um, two, that every community would, um, would be served without regards to profit. Okay? So the north-south routes were highly profitable because that was where the trade was going. East-West, not so much, but the, the Post subsidized those. Three, Congress subsidized the dissemination of newspapers out of D.C., out of the Capitol, into sort of the rural hinter, hinterlands of Michigan, right? Um, so people um, uh, would be aware of what was happening in Congress. In fact, Madison, who 
was pro sort of involvement, was blown away by how many people were writing in with you know specific knowledge of uh, each act of uh, legislation. When de Tocqueville comes to America to sort of marvel at our democracy, he's struck by how rural bloggers in Michigan know as much about the political events in DC than um, residents of the capital. And he said that the post office had a hand in creating this democracy and hopes to export our model over to Europe. So the concept of postal banking um, started in uh, Great Britain in 1861. And from the beginning, the primary goal abroad, as well as in the United States, was financial inclusion. Um, the first proposal to open a savings bank in the US came in 1871 from President Grant's Postmaster General, who wanted to use postal banks to pay for the telegraph, um, but also to uh, reach um, rural, western, and um, southern uh, uh, you know, consumers uh, with savings accounts. Um, once the idea was proposed, every postmaster general from 1871 um, pushed the issue for 40 years. There were hundreds of bills before Congress before anything happened. Um, but as is often the case in banking reform, you need a panic or a crisis to get anything done. So the panic of 1907 um, is uh, what sort of paved the way for postal banking. Um, during the 1908 election, it was between William Jennings Bryan and um, uh, Taft, and um, the Democrat, um, so the problem was banks were suffering from runs constantly back in, back in the day. Like 1907 was a big panic, but there were panics um, repeatedly. So there were several options on the table. One was the Federal Reserve that Wilson worked on, but that came later. It wasn't a direct result of the 1907 panic. Um, in 1908, Taft says, the conservative says, postal banking is a way to calm markets, okay, so because well, it's backed by the Treasury. Um, William Jennings Bryan says, no, we need deposit insurance, okay? Taft thinks that that is um, a uh, sacrilege to democracy because deposit insurance instills moral hazard, right? Um, who would have guessed, right? Um, so, uh, so Taft wins, and um, we get postal banking. Um, the first act is in 1910. Um, the Postal Banking Act passes Congress. Um, and Taft saw postal banking as a way of helping, he says, the credit star regions like the South and the West. Okay? Um, the proposal was vehemently opposed by the banks, who were fearful that it would take some of their customers. Um, so they made some compromises. One was that 95% of the funds would stay in local banks. Right? So localism, thanks to Jefferson. Um, it was deeply rooted um, in uh, sort of our uh, public policy, and no one wanted the money to flow to Treasury, right? What, you know, during these debates, they're just saying, what could Treasury possibly do with this money? Right? There was just no sense of um, national uh, debt at the time, right? So we, um, uh, they didn't want the money to flow to Treasury, so they, 95% would stay local, and the other was that they called them the poor man's banks, to sort of assure banks that we're not taking your customers, so they kept how much they could pay to their deposits at 2.5%, which was lower than what banks were able to pay. And they kept um, the amount you could you know, uh, put in the bank to uh, $500. Later on, it was up to $2,500. But that really made it such that only um, low-income people or, um, uh, could use these banks. Um, so uh, by 1913, uh, it was wildly successful. Right, The Times reported that there were $32 million in deposits within two years. Um, all of which they said came from stocking banks, right? So people not coming from um, the banking sector. But the customer base surprised everyone. Um, so quoting one 1913 administrator who said, the postal savings system was extremely popular everywhere except where they expected it to be popular. Um, so it wasn't the West and the South that flocked to these banks. It was recent immigrants in um, urban areas. And why um, the post office was meeting them at the ports with leaflets in 24 different languages offering services. And many of these immigrants were coming from Europe where they were familiar with the postal banks. And they trusted the government much more than they trusted the private banking system, which they should have. Because during the time, private banks would go up in flames and you would lose your deposits. Um, so by 1915, immigrants owned 70% of the deposits in the um, postal banks. But that changed quickly with the Great Depression. Um, as the deposits swelled in the postal banks, um, uh, they doubled each year from 1929 to 1934. Um, so by the end of um, that era, there was 1.2 billion deposits in the postal banks. And this trend would have continued 
had President Roosevelt not had broader banking reform in mind. So President Roosevelt chose deposit insurance as opposed to postal banking as a way of calming um, the markets. And this um, has an interesting history, which I won't have time to go over, but it has a lot to do with the South's sway over the Senate. Um, the, you couldn't, he couldn't get any of the New Deal passed without the South um, signing on, which is why many of the New Deal provisions um, exempted or sort of, how do you say it, were discriminatory. They just, uh, blacks couldn't get any of these uh, proposals. But also, the South wanted small banks. They didn't want all the money to flow to New York. And so deposit insurance is a way to keep Southern small banks viable um, where, and, and not, compet not have to compete with big money center banks. So we chose deposit insurance. However, the postal banks were retooled immediately after the Great Depression um, to sell war bonds. Um, so uh, first they sold um, depression bonds to, to sort of you know, bring down the debt after the depression. And then they started selling defense savings stamps across the country. Some of these are sort of ominous um, looking stamps. By the end of World War II, the government had raised $8 billion in war funding from the post office alone. De deposits reached their peak in 1947 with $3.4 billion and 4 million users. This was because um, soldiers abroad, po the post innovated banking by mail, so they were sending their um, uh, salaries home um, by mail. So the swift rise was followed by a sharp decline. By the 1950s, the postal banks were no longer attractive. They gave less interest than banks, and um, banks were now everywhere, right? So. Um, this was the golden era of community banking and roads and cars. So why would you go to the post office when there's banks sort of all over, credit unions, SNLs? No, again, this would not be the, um, the case just decades later. Um, so by 1965, um, there were, it's, it's another political, I think, a very interesting political story why the uh, postal banks were um, uh, sort of put to an end. But the... the um, First, the proposals to put it to an end started in the Banking Committee by um, Senator Bennett, who was charged of the Banking Committee. So it came from the banks who wanted post offices out. And President Johnson um, rolled, uh, sort of ended the system in 1966. So um, once, once that ended, um, uh, there, there, has, there had been talk um, about it since, right? It died a very quiet death, right? No one noted it um, in 1970 when all the posts. Um, uh, when all the deposits were gone, Time Magazine did a profile of the you know postal banks, and they said it was full of misstatements, and basically they just focused on the war stamp, right? They really didn't say all that much else. But um, postal banking, you know, there's three sort of huge things that postal banking, um, I think, did that have been historically um, unaccounted for. One is postal banking was um, almost the alternative to federal deposit insurance, right? So it was safe money. Um, it, it was it reduced the, the risk of uh, moral hazard. Two, it, um, recent research shows that it prevented many bank runs during the Great Depression. Right? So as money, uh, it, it, it uh, provided um, fleeing depositors with a safe place to put their money and, and infused calm into a very panicked um, and overheated system. Um, three is that the post office helped fund the two world wars, right, and some of the Great Depression debt. But crucially, the post office was the most successful experiment we've had in financial inclusion in the United States, including the credit union and the SNL and all of these sectors that get so much more credit, I think, than they um, deserve. I, mean, I went into this project wanting to come out, because I, I went in as a credit union, SNL, industrial bank believer. That's what started my research into this, is to reinvite these banks. And as I looked into this history, I was like, actually, these banks didn't do anything until they were plugged into the New Deal. It was the post office that did the most. And so I, again, I say most academic papers don't end with a solution. I, I randomly stumbled upon um, this one. But, it, but I, I'm increasingly convinced that it's really the only solution um, given the scale of the problem. So this is what I think. The post office could do this um, not only because it's got this founding mission as part of our democracy, um, and it's a public institution still, um, but there's several reasons why I think products through the post office could underprice naturally um, some of the market alternatives. So they could offer um, savings accounts, checking accounts, um, bonds possibly, um, money transfer, maybe small loans, right? Um, 
Bank accounts uh, without onerous fees obviously would help many of the unbanked and underbanked. Um, offering financial services at lower rates than Western Union um, and these um, check cashers would be very simple. These are risk-free transactions. Okay, most of what the check cashers pass on to customers as price is, is for overhead. Okay, so they would naturally lower those. Um, lending is obviously going to be more difficult and more controversial. All lending is risk-taking. There will be defaults and losses, um, and all those will have to be priced for. But for many reasons, I think that the post office has a chance of underpricing naturally some of these high-cost loans. Um, and, and, and I can talk more about that, but basically it has to do with scale. Um, the way banking works is that the, the less money you can spend in overhead, underwriting, um, you know, the more cross-selling you can do, um, the lower you can um, price your products. Right? One example of this is Walmart. I think Walmart is actually a great example of a, a company who is underpricing um, the check cashers and the payday lenders. Um, so it's either going to be Walmart or some government agency, I think, that can, can reach that scale. Um, but I think, look, I mean, just as the government creates, you know, looping back into the beginning, we create, fund, maintain mortgage, student loan markets, a wide sort of credit infrastructure. Um, I think that they can help create also a small loan market. Um, this would help even the credit playing field and fix some of the glaring inequalities um, in the uh, policy of credit that we have currently. So I think the post office um, is you know, historically able to and also just um, practically um, a, a solution to this uh, problem. So I'll take your questions. Uh, um, just really quick, David is trying to track down the burritos. Uh, we're not exactly sure what's going on. We apologize again, but we thought we'd open it up to everyone to start. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, you mentioned earlier that you know, post office banking was really popular uh, you know, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, but it seems to me that like one of the things that made it so feasible was that you had these uh, very dense cities um, where you know people were relatively close to the post offices, and nowadays with uh, the rise of suburbia, and you know you have a lot of uh, lower income people living in suburbia, um, and even the cities have gotten much more uh, spread out, partly due to the population. You know, like is there still the density of post offices that makes it uh, as practical as it once was? Yeah, that's a really good question. Actually, I'm going to use other. Um, after my book came out, this group of um, researchers in Missouri decided to actually track zip code wise uh, post offices versus um, versus these fringe lenders. And what they found as they mapped the United States was that um, it would be most helpful in rural areas. So the way so so the way it works um, with payday lenders is it still is a brick and mortar business, payday lending, check cashing, because a lot of people still low income people especially still work in cash. So I think. Internet is, is certainly a part of this, and we can talk about that, but still people need locations. But what you see is, within geographic zip codes, the lower the density of banks, the higher the density of payday loans. So the question is, are there post offices in those areas to counteract that trend? And what they found is, yes, especially in rural areas. Um, so cities, there are more banks. As to whether they're accessible, I don't know. So I, I lived in Harlem for about 15 years, and there were a lot of these CRA banks there. So CRA is a community reinvestment act that forces banks essentially to have a shop in these areas, but they tended to have different products, right? Um, so, so you could get your mortgage or big loans, but they weren't giving these small loans. So in Harlem specifically, if you wanted a small loan or a check cashing, there were just tons of those. And there were bank branches, but they weren't giving the same product. So, you know, and in contrast, the post office in Harlem was the most annoying place ever, right? There's always lines out the door. It was yeah. super inefficient. However, it was a community center. Uh, there's a ton of people there. I wouldn't go there for, for my services, but you know, I, I'm, I'm a privileged person, so I didn't have to. Um, right, and, and, uh, sorry, I'm taking a few seconds. To follow up on that, you know, like uh, I, I lived uh, by Union Square, and the post office near there was similarly, like, you know, the, it seemed like you know, the people in line were, you know, about what you'd expect from people living by Union Square. But you know, still, there were these huge 
massive lines, you know, any, almost any time of day. You know, you could be in the line for literally 30, 45 minutes, and it just seemed, uh, you know, impractical, well, impractical or like really tough to ask people to take that time out of the day for these uh, small things. Where you know, even if I go to uh, my the city bank, uh, you know, I could be in and out, and there's still lines, but I could be in and out in five, 10 minutes. So like, what what has to change there to you know, yeah. Just have this go yeah. So let me let me answer that because that that's a question I get all the time. The, the post office is a dinosaur. It's dying. Um, you know, it's inefficient, etc. A um, couple things about that. Um, one is that they do manage to get mail to every house in the country every day, right? Um, two, um, we're not talking about um, you know, go to a pawn shop or a payday lender, right? So, so I think some of the, mostly I give this presentation to middle class people who have the comforts of banking and. Um, uh, you know, we can go to Chase and have them, you know, serve our needs. But this other sector of people um, don't have that privilege. So the reality of that is, um, so I went to my, again, an anecdotal, but I think it, it bears repeating. I don't know what, what this is like, and maybe some of us don't. I went to the water office when I moved to Georgia to open up my water account, right? And I got in line, and the people in line, um, you know, uh, they were there. There was like about ten people, and this woman came out from the back, maybe saw that I didn't know what I was doing. And she says, what do you need? And I said, I'm trying to open up my water account. I went to the back. She says, you don't belong in this line. You know, I went to the back, opened up my water, set up auto pay, walked out, and I said, what is this line for? And she said, these are people on their lunch break paying a water bill in cash, okay? So then I thought, well, they have to now go to their, you know, gas bill, and then they have to go to their phone bill and their um, cell phone bill, right? Um, so. You know, yes, it's inconvenient maybe to sit for 30 minutes in line to put your money in the postal bank, um, but that might reduce the other 30 minutes in line that you're spending at every water office just paying your bills in cash. The other thing is, I, I um, as we talk through the post office through this, it's not as though, I mean, I don't want to do the 1910 model. We're not talking about like literally, you know, a bank in the post office where you get a stamp and it's a bond. Um, you, you would link it up into an internet bank. Right? Right, so right, right. you could use your balances online, um, and, and the money um, would look like other money, as if it would be digital. And I think that is, and that is the um, the trick with some of the low income, the low income sectors, uh, people stuck in cash. It's expensive. It's inefficient. And we need to get those people into digital. And then there's all sorts of solutions, right? I get calls from fintech people all the time, being like, "Oh, I have a solution for the low income." And I'm like, "Well, how do you get them from cash to your platform?" And that's the main problem. Yes. Um, I was curious, um, just I touched on this a little bit, but I was curious to hear some of the more specifics about, you know, postal reform has been trying to go through Congress for a long time and how this piece fits into the political debates around postal reform bills. Yeah, so if you'd asked me a couple of months ago, I would have had a different answer. Um, um, so, um, okay, so the big thing with the post office is in 2006, there was a Postal Reorganization Act. And essentially what it did was Congress trying to privatize the post office. Um, and they uh, pre uh, they made them pre-fund all their pensions. And so since then, they've had a $5 billion shortfall every year because they've had to pre-fund their pensions. So, so this is a strategy to, to make them private. What, what, what some interests in Congress want to do is to privatize and to sell off parts of the post office. Because it is quite profitable, um, if you can believe it. Right? Um, and to cut off the pensions of the, um, of the unionized. It's very you know, uh, well unionized. Um, so uh, that created the shortfall. And then there has been reforms within that time. Nothing has come to the floor. As far as postal banking, I've been working um, uh, with Senator Warren for um, a couple of years. I, I proposed this in 2010, and the post office IG's office, so not the post office, they have an inspector general office. They made a white paper proposing this and how much money, it was like a business plan, about how much money they could make. And then after that, it gained some traction, right? We got Bernie Sanders on board, which gave it a lot of great public appeal. And then we, had, we started having meetings with Treasury, and Treasury was very interested. Obama, in his last year, um, said essentially that financial inclusion was a, a main interest of his, but didn't really push it at all. Um, hardly even walked over to Treasury, you know, um, his last year. Um, and so at, at Treasury, we were sort of moving along with this, and, and then of course everything halted. Um, so I, I don't know um, what will happen. I, I imagine, so some of the main proponents of privatizing the post office are Daryl Issa, 
And um, we, I was hoping that he would miss his seat, um, but he did not. And um, so I imagine that he will be uh, active in this, unfortunately. Yes, sir. Um, so you, t you talked a lot about how, you know, banking for the, the less privileged is exceedingly expensive. Um, on the other side, I mean, I, I mean, I don't think that it's unreasonable to say that providing banking for the underprivileged is also exceptionally expensive. Um, and, and so, I mean, just because of you know you 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 have these scale issues, you know, it's simply not as profitable to, to make an eight hundred dollar loan as it is an eight million dollar loan. Um, has anybody done the math in terms of whether or not you could make this profitable and provide these? provide small loans to a large, high-risk population, because if you don't have $400, you know, taking out a $100 loan, and you probably don't have a great asset to, you know, you know to back this loan, um, I mean, that's a high-risk loan. I mean, and, and certainly there there is a happy medium somewhere between, like, the 3% I can buy my house at versus, like, the 300,000%, you know, that I'm being charged for my payday loan. You know, where where is that, and and can we get to a, a, a at least a revenue neutral sort of? Yeah, that's a level. really highly complex question. Um, and but I will answer it. I think yes. Um, but it is it's not a, a, a given. So so one example is Walmart, right? So Walmart is able to give lower cost loans, and so, so we can break it up into financial services and loans. Loans is a trickier question. Okay, financial services. I think that question is easy. Mm -hmm. We can give bank accounts much more uh, inexpensively, okay? And I think what bank account, giving someone a place to put $500, because banks will not let you put in $500 without charging you, right? There will be fees, there will be overdrafts, there will be hassles, okay? Because for a bank, any account below $2,000 costs them money, okay? But it doesn't have to. So there is a way to offer someone a $500, place to put $500 um, that is inexpensive. Almost free. Okay, we, and there's a platform that, that we could use for that um, because banks there's there's banks that are hungry for deposits that don't want to handle them themselves. So what we have now in the banking sector is broker deposits. So they'll take deposits from you know low uh, volatile places and put them in banks, and the FDIC will insure it as a sort of cross um, uh, institution. Um, so so that is easy, and I think what, one one thing that that does is providing a savings account. Just a small buffer actually might reduce the need for these loans, right? So one of the problems with so much need for payday loans is that people just aren't saving, and they are saving some because they don't have a place to do it. So that's one. Now, can we lower the cost of loans? Um, again, I think this comes down to um, right. Uh, what is how? What is the cost of lending to someone that is low income? The payday lenders will say, and I've sat in many places with them. These are all high default, high risk borrowers, right? And so we have to charge 300% to all of them. But I will say two things. One is there is no, research shows there isn't price competition among these lenders. They, they compete based on um, ease of credit and location, okay? The reason we know is as soon as a state, you know, brings up their interest, everyone charges the maximum level by law. They're not competing on price. So I think the market is less um, perfect here, right? Um, the other is that they're not doing any underwriting. In other words, they're not distinguishing between some, a customer that walks in their door who is poor but credit worthy versus one that is poor and not credit worthy. That's the magic of banking, right? That's why banks make the big bucks. They can look at borrowers and say, I mean, I can't say this with a straight face post crisis, but that is what they do. They try to manage risks. Um, and so any underwriting that is done at the uh, public level at the post office level would be, you know, 100% more than, than what is done now. And so if you're able to, to um, sort between these bars, and there are ways to do it that, that you could. The other is um, collection. This is where it gets really hairy public policy-wise, that payday lenders spend a ton of money on collection, um, even though their defaults are actually quite low. So let me mention that also. Their def defaults are minuscule. But they count as default, so you can take out a loan, so let's say five hundred dollars, and roll, keep rolling it over. You could have paid two thousand dollars on that loan, so you paid off the principal and then some, and they can still count it as default if you miss that last payment. So their default numbers are not to be trusted in some ways. 
Right. So um, anyway, uh, I think um, I can't remember where I was going with that. But um, it, it, it just quick follow it, 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 with with Walmart and, and the somewhat business model. Do you see it as a loss lead for them? People thought it was. It's not. It's okay. it's highly profitable. It's not a loss leader. Yeah, um, they're making more money from this Green Dot and Bluebird. They sell. They have a prepaid card um, and this Green Dot bank account. It is not a loss leader. Walmart's been trying to get into banking. Um, one of the first deals I did at the bank was um, the, their 2005 application to get one of these industrial loan companies. So they've been trying to get into banking because that's that's a money maker for them, um, especially for their customers. Do you, have, do you have any idea of their average loan size and, and rate? I it's, mean, is it, it's, is it payday, it's payday loan size. It's low, lower than $1,000. And what they're doing is that they're offering savings accounts, and people are borrowing from the savings account. So they're paying overdraft fees that equal the interest. So it's not a loan. They're overdrafting. And this is what um, postal banks in Britain do this. You're borrowing from yourself and paying overdraft fees, and it roughly equals something like 300% APR. But we don't count it as APR. Yes? Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is you talk about how um, just uh, the savings, checking account, money transfer services are very expensive for the poor. Uh, but I'm not sure if this is uh, an, it's just an anecdote or something, but I have a banking account with TD, and the minimum balance, the monthly balance is $100. As long as you have $100 in your balance, uh, they don't charge you any fee. So, uh, and I, I think there are other banks that offer similar services, even though I don't know about them. So I'm wondering like, whether it's still the case that it's very expensive to get a, the regular financial services. Um, my other question is about the small loans that we're talking about. Uh, so we're talking about how you can distinguish between poor but creditworthy and poor but not creditworthy. Uh, but for, I think the one reason banks don't want to deal with the, the poor is the fact that they don't have a credit history or a very good credit history. Uh, so I'm just wondering how you think uh, the postal bank can get around that. Like what are the innovations that postal bank can bring on the table? Yeah, um, so two things. One is, um, I mean the data shows you, you can get free checking at you know uh, less than $100, but what you get is overdraft fees. And I don't know what your history is like, but what the, you know, the data across the sector for low income folks is that they are choosing not to go have bank accounts because it ends up being more expensive. It's not a myth, it is actually the case. Yes. But, but isn't overdraft just a loan? Because if you're if you're overdrafting your it's yeah. a small loan then it makes yes, sense. Yes, but it's random, right? So it's not the price of they would rather, you know, all the surveys show they would rather take out a loan and pay for it, knowing what it is, as opposed to get a randomized sort of you know, you can get an overdraft fee um, once and then you know it can hit again. Right, so they can, um, you can get like three overdraft fees for a couple of transactions. I guess my point is, so you were talking about how people are going to the office to pay in cash or gas bills and their water bills and whatever. So what my point was, if you have a checking account, you can use the online auto transfer. Right. And I'm saying that's the problem. They don't have checking accounts. And, and the thing is, with checking accounts, you don't you don't have to do this overdraft thing to have a checking account. Uh, right? You can use those free checking accounts. No, I that. mean, you, you do. You do, um, checking accounts end up becoming more expensive because of overdraft fees, and because they do have minimum balances and they don't advertise. And when we can talk, maybe I'll point yeah. you to the book, but that is, um, and I forget your other question, oh, the credit worthy versus not, credit history, FICO scores. FICO scores are really blunt tools. They're great for mortgage lending and maybe student lending, but not for small lending. So that's why payday lenders don't use them. But there's a lot of ways that you could sort, oh, this is what I was saying. Okay, if I, I remember my way. There's, there are other... Um, data-centered ways of sorting the credit worthy for the not credit credit worthy. Some of them you would be uncomfortable with because they would involve like big data type stuff. Um, some of them would be more finely tuned, right? Um, and so there's a variety of ways um, that one can do this. The other is the default. I was going to say that payday lenders um, end up so so much of their cost is in chasing down these loans through litigation and default. One thing, and again, this is controversial, is that the post office, because of its link with the treasury, can um, garnish tax returns if you give them permission. And that would bring down their cost, give you a, a lower interest um, rate right, uh, on the loan. Uh, but, but people are going to be uncomfortable with that. Um, so you'd have to be very upfront in what they could and couldn't garnish, right? Maybe they could take your earnings on tax credit, but not Social Security benefits, things like that. Uh, thanks for your ideas. This is really inspiring, and uh, I'm just wondering what you think for someone like us sitting in this room. Like, how could we best 
uh, work and try to operationalize these ideas? Like, where's the best space to, to advocate right now? Yeah. Um, um, the what, So um, I, I think Senator Warren has been on the lead of this. Um, but uh, as an umbrella organization, Americans for Financial Reform have, have some really creative um, ideas. The thing with financial reform is there's five financial industry lobbyists for every one legislature. Right, Congress in a second. So, um, and and there are um, only two organizations that represent consumers. Right, now, right. You talk about public choice, right? Who who gets what they want in Congress? In the financial sector, it is widely, you know, uh, skewed toward the financial. So, supporting any industry that's at least just speaking for consumers um, would be great. And obviously, grassroots public. Um, consciousness, you know, uh, trying to change the conversation, which is what I like what money, uh, matters, is it? The, the modern money network? The modern money network does, is this um, changing the conversation away from, um, the, the way we've been talking about banking over the last, you know, pre-financial crisis has always been about, you know, efficiency and market modeling and risk management, um, but they turned out, a lot of those ideas turned out to not be right. And so we need to reopen that conversation and figure out exactly what is true and what isn't true. Um, just really quick before the next question, I know people need to eat lunch, and we were informed that two orders came in on the same name, so they were both delivered to the wrong room. Um, but David did just step out, so I don't know. Maybe they're bringing new food. I'm not sure, but just just so you know. Okay. So I just want to follow up because I mean, the other way we've been talking about banking forever is as intermediation, when in fact it's increasing bigger it's about money creation. So that there's um, you know then more profits coming because of uh, public support for money creation, right? This is the way that we chose to design the system in order to reduce the operating money supply. Uh, so so one I guess one general question is you know could you know, how would it change things if you actually um, uh, if we embraced money and we began to articulate banking as money creation and saw the public subsidy and private senior that actually, you know, that uses to, to uh, money creation going to the banks, right? Could we then rethink the public obligation that comes with that profit? The, the other question is somewhat related, and I, I was totally intrigued when you said that post office banks had to place 95% of the funds with local banks. So the question is really specific. It, were, post, were local banks using those funds for money creation? As, were those funds, if, if so, then basically the post office was sub, the post office banks and their depositors were subsidizing local banking and money creation, fractional reserve or, or endogenous credit, credit creation, whichever one, whichever model you choose, for you know from 1910 through the 1950s. That's right. Yes. So, and the only reason that the post office banks were safe was because the treasury was behind them, as opposed to actually having, you know, actually acting like a warehouse for the funds. Yes. Except in, in 1948, um, then they went to treasury to, to, for the war debt. So before that, so it was only between 1910 and around 1946, 47, and then it went to treasury. So they were okay with that. But before that, yes, 95 percent would stay in. And be used by local banks for lending. And and, and yeah, your first question about money creation—that's sort of the my first um, the first part of the book that I try to convince people is that banking is not what you think it is. And right? banking is not some market that is run by supply and demand. Essentially, it is a way for the government. I mean, and I say like to say that it's subsidized. It's like calling the wheels to your car a bonus feature. Banking doesn't work without this government. Um, aspect of money creation. So to say, you know, this is not a subsidy to the poor. This is just allowing some of that money creation to also flow down to those who might need it in the form of credit, which is how money creation has worked, um, you know, at that level. So absolutely, I think this is an equally, and, but not even close to reaching equality. This is just a drop in the bucket of uh, the money creation you're seeing at that level. Right. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, I think it's official. The food. Yeah. They messed up the order. Two people repeat the name David. The order from the same caterer. They canceled ours until the regular. So, yeah, uh, we apologize, but please 
Uh, thank Professor Bardon for coming in. Yeah, thank you.